Welcome to you all today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Elisa, Alicia Salas, Vice Provost and University Librarian at the University of Oregon. Prior to joining the UO in June 2021, Salas was Associate Dean for Research and Academic Services at Carnegie Mellon University. A native Oregonian, Salas earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Portland State University before receiving a master's degree in Library and Information Science from the University of Washington. She has also earned a doctorate in higher education from the University of Liverpool in the UK. Thanks, Alicia, so much for coming on the show and welcome to U of O. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us first a little bit about your background. Yeah, I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. I um, uh, got my professional start uh, in Portland. I uh, moved overseas to work in the Middle East for about 10 years. Um, I worked for a public institution of higher education in the United Arab Emirates, uh, a women's college for several years, um, which was an amazing experience. Most of those uh, students were uh, young women, Emirati women who were first generation um, college students uh, over there. Uh, moved to Carnegie Mellon first at their branch campus in Doha, Qatar. There's a fully fledged degree granting branch campus in Doha um, where I spent several years as a faculty member uh, doing research on um, how adults learn from reading text in print or uh, in digital formats. Uh, and then I moved to Carnegie Mellon's home campus in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to take on uh, my administrative role there. Uh, spent a lot of effort developing um, services for researchers and supporting the research enterprise um, there before finally coming home now to the U of O. And I'm just so excited. It's a huge privilege uh, for me to, to be here uh, and, and very excited and optimistic about the, the road ahead here. So what led to your interest in library science and higher education? My mother worked at the public library when I was a youth, and I spent a lot of um, afternoons after school uh, down hanging out at the public library, Multnomah County Public Library uh, up in Portland, uh, waiting for her to get off work. Uh, I uh, got a job as a bookshelver there um, because I, you know, I was familiar with it and, you know, thought it would be fun uh, to work with my mom. And then as I was working as a bookshelver, I uh, encountered all this amazing mentorship from more senior, more seasoned uh, librarians. I became interested in intellectual freedom at that time. Um, so there were some, um, some trainings that I attended, some mentors that for them, this was a an area of passion. And I just, I just was really compelled by the idea that anybody can walk into a public library and learn about or read about anything they want to, you know. And, um, you know, the idea that, and, and you know, for me, um, it just felt so much uh, freer than school where you're kind of assigned what to learn about and, and what to read. Uh, so I just, I felt really, I developed a passion for that area, I felt really uh, interested in it, decided I wanted to pursue librarianship as a career. Uh, and then it wasn't until a few years later that I actually made the switch from public to academic libraries um, and, and developed my career more in that direction. But that's, that's how I got started. What inspired you to switch from public to university uh, libraries? It was actually my experiences with users, library users. Um, I found that working with students uh, was rewarding in ways that um, aren't as obvious working with members of the public. So at a public library, I found that a lot of times you'd interact with members of the public once or twice, you wouldn't necessarily see them again. But when you're working with students and faculty, you develop these relationships with them that last years and you see them grow and develop and change and you see the impact of how what you're doing you know influences their their work over time and so that ongoing relationship and that visibility that what i'm doing is making a difference um, uh, kind of pulled me in and public librarians make a huge difference in the world and their their work is so important um, but i think it isn't always as obvious you know to from that perspective um, what that impact is you don't always see it sometimes it's invisible 
So you've already told us a little bit about the time that you spent working in the Middle East and the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. um, you said a little bit about where you worked and, and what you did. W do you have any particular lessons that you learned from that experience that you would be willing to share with us? Oh, gosh. Yeah, the, the 10 years I spent working in the Gulf was um, so enlightening in so many ways. I learned so many lessons. Um, you know, for one thing, I um, learned to be a minority. You know, I learned to be um, sort of um, the minority voice, the minority person in, a, in an extremely diverse multicultural environment. And when I was working at the public institution, of course, it was majority um, Emirati, majority local. Um, and so, you know, I just um, really changed, I think. Um, that experience really made me humble. Um, getting away from the United States gave me a new perspective on just, just how big and wide the world is and how many different ways of, of knowing there are out there. Um, uh, you know, I had um, some really interesting experiences with um, cultural heritage uh, while I was over there. Um, you know, I, I learned so much about, um, there was a, a library across the street from where I worked um, where they've developed a big collection of travelogues of, um, from, you know, Europeans and others around the world who have traveled historically to the Middle East. And they've collected these travelogues that give these outsider perspectives on the region and what it's like. Um, and I, I just, the whole experience was a new way of seeing the world for me. Um, and it, it brought me back to the United States with just a, a, a sense of, of humility. The, the US is, is not the center of the world. Like I thought it was when I left basically, I think is, was my big takeaway. I, I would just note that on your um, video greeting to the students and the faculty, you begin that greeting by greeting us in Arabic. So I assume you learned Arabic when you were there as well. I did. It's, I'm not proud of my level of Arabic. It's not um, you know, uh, incredibly fluent, but uh, I did. I learned Arabic um, while I was there. I converted to Islam while I lived there. Um, I um yeah i i have come back here and um uh gotten involved that there's a mosque in eugene actually uh with a with an islamic community here which surprised me i didn't realize that thought thought it was too small of a town um but yeah i uh, i really tried to soak it in and, and take advantage of the experience as much as possible to learn and broaden my horizons so tell us a little bit about uh, your role as Associate Dean for Research and Academic Services at Carnegie Mellon, in particular, some of your accomplishments that you, of which you are the most proud. Oh gosh, yes, it was a it was a wonderful experience. Um, some of the things I I am proud of, and you know that I focused on there, had to do with um, accelerating the research enterprise helping scholars, researchers, and faculty um, become, uh, fulfill their potential, you know, and, and achieve the things that they wanted to achieve. Um, I, my team, I, I invested in a new program that my team launched. Um, I had a director who really did a lot of the heavy lifting there, um, but it was for a data collaborations program where we, the library served as a connector to help um, data scientists, so those with skills in data, and uh, data holders, so maybe scholars who had data sets of different types, um, and to match make and to get them together to be able to collaborate. Um, one of the things that I found was a challenge um, among our, our folks was, especially in um, humanities and arts disciplines in particular, um, you know, we found a lot of faculty and scholars that really wanted to investigate questions in new ways. So kind of maybe more traditional humanistic uh, forms of inquiry, but using new methods and new tools and um, computational methods, for example. And so, uh, you know, a lot of what we tried to do was provide training, resources, tools, 
purchase um, APIs and licenses that would enable them to do large corpus analysis of text um, databases and text sets and things like that. Um, and then offer training in those tools, but we found that the demand totally outpaced our ability in the library to actually offer or, or meet those needs. So that idea of starting to match make within the university community was in part pragmatic. It was sort of a, how can we develop some more bandwidth, you know, to, to get this um, work done and this knowledge transfer done. Um, but then it turned out to also just be a great way of fostering more interdisciplinary collaboration and, um, you know, developing new partnerships among faculty and scholars there. So that's, that's something that um, I really enjoyed. I think it's important. Um, I think it is enabling, you know, new, new projects and new types of research activity um, among, among faculty and scholars there. Um, we also uh, launched a, um, a couple of new services. So one uh, while I was there was around um, bibliometrics and um, research metrics and analysis. And so that's something that we found many faculty, individual faculty are looking for individual research impact metrics, right? Like where's my scholarship being used? What impact is it having? But then department heads and larger units are looking for how does our work as a faculty group compare to our peers? Um, how much, you know, with the shift to more open access publishing, that was a big area of inquiry, right? How much of our um, output is available open? How much of our new publication is openly available? And then at, um, at Carnegie Mellon in particular, we had an initiative towards um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So our team was also doing analysis around how the university's research outputs uh, were contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and where they, where they align. So that all of that sort of bibliometric analysis and uh, research metrics analysis fit very well with the tools and expertise that we have um, in the library with, with information professionals. And again, I think was making a, a big difference in um, pro, you know, shifting and supporting programmatic directions across the university. Great, thanks for that. So let's turn now to uh, the University of Oregon. What attracted you to the University of Oregon? I mean, you, we, you've told us that you are a native Oregonian, but what what was it about this job in particular that appealed? I began looking at the role and the University of Oregon um, initially just because it had been such a long time. And I thought, oh, you know, I wonder what the UO was up to. Haven't haven't been keeping tabs in so long. And what I saw when I started looking was um, all these initiatives that give me great cause for optimism. I mean, you know, I immediately noticed the Knight Campus uh, coming up, the new data science um, major uh, program that uh, has developed and is growing rapidly um, from what I've seen. Uh, I noticed the uh, president's, President Schill's um, efforts to grow the ranks of tenure track faculty. And, um, you know, those were all to me signs of a university that's moving in a really positive trajectory. Um, and um, you know, probably just, just looking towards greater success and greater heights in the future. It's attractive to me to think about being a part of that, you know, and how can I help? How can I help build this um, institution and, and achieve what we hope to be these new heights in the years ahead? So basically that was, that was it. So you are the U of O's first vice provost and university librarian. Why is being a vice provost a benefit for a university librarian? Well, that's a great question. And personally, from my perspective, I'm not sure that I come down really hard on one side or the other of whether uh, the university librarian is designated as a vice provost or a dean. Um, I think no matter which, um, which bucket, the university librarian is in, you sort of have to act as a pseudo, you know, if you're a vice provost, you have to act as a pseudo dean. If you're a dean, you kind of have to act as a pseudo VP. Um, it's this very middle ground area. That's also true of the library itself. Um, we have an administrative operation, a service side, but then we also have 
a faculty side where we teach and we do research and you know all of those things. So it really is um, a middle ground. I can see why um, the university went this direction, um, and I certainly see a lot of synergy, you know, and work very well with the other vice provosts um, here at the university. Um, but my, my own perspective is, is a very tough call to say that one direction is distinctively better than the other. So I suspect that many of our students, faculty, and community members are not fully aware of the number and strengths of UO's libraries. Can you give us a quick overview of the range of the libraries? I mean, I think there are people that don't realize that we have more than one library. Um, and say something about the strengths of, as you see it, of our libraries here. Thank you. Well, there are tremendous strengths here. I knew there were tremendous strengths here coming in, and I've just been learning about more since I landed about three months ago. Um, we've got seven library locations in total, so that includes the main night library. Um, but also our Price Science Commons Library, uh, Portland Design, Math Library, uh, Small Library out at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I got them all, but definitely more than one location. And uh, we've got um, about 3 million volumes, but the, the number of volumes to me is not as distinctive or important as what is included in those collections. We've got incredible holdings of um, important contributors to culture and human knowledge, especially representing the Northwest region. So our distinctive collections include works, um, the papers of Ursula K. Le Guin, Ken Kesey. Uh, this year, we just took in the papers of the filmmaker uh, Gus Van Sant, who's a Northwest native as well. Um, and then the primary source material that our faculty are generating that we collect and curate and archive is also incredibly significant to the world. We've got strengths in our collections related to athletic history at the UO, which is significant. We've also got, um, there's actually stuff all over the university that is not in our collections that I feel is very important that we bring in at some point in order to preserve it. Um, like we have faculty who have generated a video of the ocean's floors, for example, right? And that's the kind of material that will be of incredible value um, to scholars today all over the world, but in the future, you know, 50, 60, 100 years in the future. Um, so those are incredible strengths in collections. On the service side, uh, and I will say that more of the library's business is growing and focused around um, services and consulting and training that's offered to campus. And we have um, a digital scholarship services unit that I think you may have come into contact uh, before with Paul, that is um, doing an increasing amount of what I would consider to be professional level consulting uh, and training with faculty and researchers across campus, delivering um, training on computational methods, for example, um, different methods of working with data and primary sources and digital scholarship and, um, and, and those kinds of topics as well. So I see that as a strength and an area of growth uh, for the libraries, for sure. Our science library, the Price Science Commons, is such a strength. It's an incredible science library. I've been all over the world. I've been to a lot of libraries. Our science library is fabulous. Um, it's a point of pride for the personnel. Um, and the design is just so, um, it's so well designed for the needs and use of science students and faculty and researchers. Um, so really a, a showcase, I would say. So I'm speaking to you in the fall of 2021 after 20 months or 19 months of COVID lockdowns of various sorts. We have now students back on campus in numbers that we haven't seen in those 20 months. Can you say a little bit about how the old libraries are accommodating the return of students to campus? Yeah, we have, uh, the, the personnel here has really gone above and beyond and done our best to provide a warm welcome to students um, back to campus. We know that we have a sophomore class um, that in many ways is like a freshman class in that not all of them have been around or seen the campus um, during their freshman year, many were away. 
So this uh, start of the academic year, um, we had a team put together a slate of welcome events, put out extra staffing uh, in the buildings, especially the first week to be able to just welcome, personally welcome and personally direct students who are just trying to find their way um, throughout the buildings. Our first week uh, we had, oh, I don't have it in front of me, but it was, it was probably close to 25,000 um, individual visits to the, the various facilities. So an incredible amount of traffic after a long time of very little traffic. Uh, and our personnel just uh, adapted so well. And um, our students uh, logged many interactions with staff and were able to find their way. Um, we've been really focused on getting students oriented, helping them understand uh, who they can contact um, for help in the future, um, who they can reach out to. Um, and uh, of course, observing all the uh, protocols, COVID protocols, right? So um, managing uh, masks and distancing in the spaces. Um, very pleased that some of our cafes have reopened. So the students have sustenance and nutrition as they're spending long hours um, studying in our spaces. Um, but so far, uh, you know, we seem to be getting there. Even, even me, every time I've walked through the floor the first couple of weeks of campus, I've been stopped three, four, five, six times on the way. Um, uh, by students uh, looking for directions, and it's wonderful to, to see them back in the spaces. So I know that advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility are um, important priorities for you. Can you tell us how UO's libraries can and do help to advance those goals? Yeah, um, it's great timing for that question because we just reconvened our library diversity committee for a new term. Uh, appointed new members of that uh, committee and are working on a new um, strategy and plan for the year ahead for activities. And so that committee is discussing what efforts can yield the most, the best return for uh, fostering DEI. We do have a really big recruiting need in the libraries at the moment. We're about 20% vacant um, with uh, attrition uh, over the last year and a half. And that presents a wonderful opportunity in our recruitment um, to be very deliberate and intentional about utilizing best practices for recruitment, generating good diverse pools of candidates um, and being thoughtful about how we build that workforce um, in a representative and inclusive way. So that's something our committee is thinking about and working on. We also have a, um, the libraries put out an anti-racist statement uh, a little more than a year ago. It was um, during the period of unrest after the George Floyd murder and committed to doing some things to foster uh, equity and inclusion in the libraries. Now is the time to revisit that statement and see if we've made good on it um, and make some assessments about progress there. So this is a, another priority at the moment. Looking ahead, we have um, work to do on inclusive collections. And so uh, I know that our, again, our special collections and university archives folks are tremendous. Um, and our personnel are thinking about ways that we can um, bring out perhaps overlooked or underrepresented voices from history, from our archives and special collections. In fact, we just now um, have released a new exhibit uh, in the Knight Library that I believe will be traveling around campus called Our Impact Through Images. And it's a great curated exhibit of some of the wonderful social impact the UO has had on the world and on the community um, told through the stories and letters and photographs um, that are in our archives. And the stories that have been featured there are um, many minority voices. So for instance, we feature some students who were displaced during World War II when there were curfews on Japanese Americans and um, many were interned. And we had students at the university here um, who are administrators, including Carl Onthank, worked very hard to uh, transfer 
to universities that were inland and that, that were not facing the same restrictions for the students. This exhibit could easily have focused on the story of an administrator like Carl Unthank, but in this particular exhibit, he is more of a footnote and the primary focus is on the student themselves, right? The, the, the students of Japanese descent um, who were having the experience. So this is the kind of archival and curatorial work that you know, brings out those stories, um, centers some different voices than we, we might normally hear from, um, and that I would like to see us do, do more of. I think it's really valuable. So you are something of a research expert on the question of digital um, reading and, and digital technology in, in universities. I know, for example, that you've done uh, research on the qualitative differences for students between reading print books and ebooks. Will you tell us a little bit about that research and also about your view of the kind of transformation of academic libraries that has been brought about by digital technology? Sure. Um, this is such an interesting area, and I got started in it uh, originally when I was teaching. And I adopted an e-textbook in my course, and I was surprised that the students didn't all immediately love it, you know, and it, you know, made me curious, well, why, what's, what's going on here? And that set off a multi-year investigation uh, into this subject area. And it turns out from the research that I've done and my colleagues have done that there are some differences in how we learn and absorb um, information from text, depending on whether it's in print or digital format, but it's also situational. There's a lot of variables that go into it. So you can't uniformly say, you know, one is better than learning for the other. You can say one is better for learning than the other in these circumstances, you know, under these conditions. And the findings from my research have sometimes been cited by, um, you know, people who strongly favor the print experience. And they say, oh, here's the proof that, you know, print is better because we have found that in some cases, you know, print does seem to lend itself better to learning. Um, but I don't think that's the end of the story. I do think that technology, um, we're at a point in time, technology is, is at a point in time in its evolution. And I actually think that the results of this research could inform the development of better technology that better takes advantage of the affordances of both um, print and digital text and eventually gets us to a digital text that is always as good for learning as a print text. So, you know, it's, it's a very interesting um, and nuanced area. I do think that the research can inform our practice in libraries um, somewhat. Um, you know, the main takeaway for me uh, right now is that um, you know each student is going to have um, their individual circumstances, their individual reading events. The stakes are different. I think the more choice we can give students um, and learners in general, uh, the better. Um, and they can make a choice that is based on their learning preferences and not based on things like what they can afford or not afford, right? So trying to make um, format choices accessible either way so that, you know, so the students can, can choose what they want. So we have to think about things like um, printing, you know, what do we charge students to print? Um, how many pages can they print out? What, what does it cost them? You know, what does it cost to purchase um, a digital version of a textbook versus a print version? If a student, learns better from reading a print? Are they at a financial disadvantage now? You know, those are the kinds of questions that I think um, there, there are implications. We should be thinking about those and considering those um, in libraries and in universities generally in, in terms of um, policies and, and the sorts of materials that we're, we're purchasing. Another finding uh, that I think about when it comes to collections, how we develop our collections here, is that the print digital learning difference seems to come out more with lengthy readings, like cover to cover. I'm going to sit down and read this book from front to back. Um, that seems to be a circumstance where more people are going to learn better from a print copy. 
And there's so much of what we collect that's not meant for that kind of use. You know, it's the, the type of material that somebody's going to take a chapter out of or read a few pages or they need a reference, right? So that's the kind of finding that we might think, you know, okay, well, why don't we save our limited, precious physical storage for the things that we know are going to benefit from it? And why don't we use our, you know, our digital assets for the things that we know are um, easy, you know, just as easy to utilize in that format? That's re really interesting. Thank you. Um, we're just about at the end of our time. We have about a minute left. My last question. Um, can you tell me a goal that you haven't already told me that you have in your mind for the near term for the UO libraries? I want to get us a good, I want to get us to a state of the art with digital preservation. That is a goal that I have. I think it's not an easy one. It takes resources, but we have so much precious, unique uh, material in our collections that um, for the long term, it's, it's our responsibility to um, preserve and care for it and make sure that it's accessible to the world and available to scholars uh, long into the future. So that's a, a major goal of mine. Well, I hope you are successful in that goal. It's certainly a valuable one. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. I've been speaking with Alicia Salas, Vice Provost and University Librarian at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.